The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. to do part two of moving into the glory. And the glory that I'm talking about is what God promised us, that you're going to see a manifestation of a glory through unity. And uh, <clears throat> you need to start by understanding, you know, when they were in the garden, there was things that they enjoyed, but because of the fall, they lost. They lost the purity of heart, right? They lost the Holy Spirit. They lost dominion, which means like authority. They lost the sense of purpose, lost the fullness of the glory, the fullness of that glory, that atmosphere that was upon them. But anyway, <clears throat> here's some of the things the Lord's been speaking, all right? I'm going to give you the promise first. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a, this is a rhema word. This is something he spoke to us uh, earlier in the week, and as far as I'm concerned, it's as good as going to come to pass. Uh, the Lord says, I'll be a wall of fire all around this church, and I'll be the glory in her midst. So what kind of a wall is that? A wall of fire. It's God himself. And just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, I'm going to surround my people. I'm, I'm feeling a real sense of protection and abiding. And you know, a lot of the scripture we read, we read it as an individual but there is a greater context for the corporate. So let's become part of something bigger than ourselves. The most difficult part of maturing is to mature beyond in rugged individualism. You know, uh, when I was growing up, I wouldn't let my dad go in the shoe store with me when I was nine years old. This is city thinking. And uh, I would ask him to give me the money because I didn't have the money at nine, although I had my first job at 10. But at nine, I'd ask him to give me the money. I didn't want my friends to see that my dad had to go into the shoe store with me. Anybody understand that kind of thinking? It's, kind of, it's really old school, South Chicago city thinking. I've got to be ma mature. I'm nine years old, and I'm worried about being mature. All right. Nowadays, it's not, we have adult lessons, and they don't seem to be worried about being mature. But anyway, um, He'd give me the money, and I'd go in, and I'd buy the shoes because I wanted to be mature. And so maturity took on a, the context, the more independent I am, the more mature I am. And to some degree, there's a truth to that. It's nice to see, you know, if you've got 40-year-old children that they're not living at home, <laughs> that they got a job, and they went out somewhere and did something with their life. That'd be nice to know. But that independence has to end with interdependent or you really never spiritually mature. You are not spiritual mature because you're independent and look what I can do. You are spiritually mature when you can become part of something bigger than yourself. Then you're interdependent. And it'd be good to get that level of maturity before you get married. Otherwise, you're getting married for someone else to complete you like you're a part of a person. No, no, no. You need to be interdependent, know how to get along with people before you get married. You need to know that that's give and take. Nothing worse than pre-marriage counseling where they'll say, why are you getting married? Because she'd be good for me. I go, oh, dear Lord, have mercy. And they don't see anything wrong with that statement. She'd be good for me. Why are you getting married? Because he'd be good for me. Yeah. I don't hear anything about, I'm going to make that man the best man he can possibly be. Instead, I'm going to change that man into my image and make him according to my likeness. Yeah, right. Good luck with that. They interviewed seventh graders. And they said, boys, how many of you when you get married someday, seventh graders, how many boys when you get married someday, that, 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 that girl's going to change you? No. Cross the board. Nobody's going to change me. Girls, how many, seventh graders, how many of you think you're going to change that man when you get married? You can change him. 
yeah. And then you wonder why there's relational problems. Unequal yoking is rampant. Now, here's the promise. Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. God spoke this and he says, Dennis, I'm speaking it to Kingdom Life Church. I'm speaking it to all your ministry affiliations. I'm speaking it to whosoever feels knit or joined at some level. You know, there's greater and lesser knittings. Some people barely attached. Some people are very attached. But nonetheless, I'm giving a word and making this available. And here it is, verses 14 to 16 in Psalm 91. Because they, he, has set his love upon me, I will. These are the I wills of the Father. And do you believe if God the Father says, I will, he will? He's not a man that he could lie, right? Here's the I wills of the Father in Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. That's for those that are abiding in him. I will set him on high because he has known my name, my reality. He's known me in reality, not in theory, not from a distance, but he has known my nature, my name, my reality. He'll call upon me and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I'm not going to say there won't be any trouble in his life, but I am with you. One of the greatest promises any believer could have. I am with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will show him my salvation. Now, basically what God says is I'm putting a supernatural wall and I'm building a wall. And you know, Nehemiah's day, each family had a different gate all around the city to close up, patch up the holes. And God's calling that forth to take place. Even now, the only legitimate wall, and I want you to say this back to me, and if you're watching by YouTube, you better learn this quickly. The only legitimate wall is God himself. Let the peace of God rule. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Any other wall is flesh. Any other wall, the enemy has access to. So God basically saying, let the peace of God rule. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who can take a city. Slow to anger. Anger is an indication that you're not blessing them that curse you, praying for them that despitefully use you. Anger is an indication of control. The opposite of control is let the peace of God rule. When Jesus is ruling, God's ruling. When peace is ruling in you, you've got Jesus and ruling in you as evidence, internal evidence. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So if you rule your spirit, that's not with willpower. It's just the opposite. It's surrendering the will to His will and letting His will rule. It's yielding. It's surrendering. Now, this goes along with Proverbs 25, 28. And this is what I saw in Jason's teaching on Nehemiah as well. Proverbs 25, 28 says, He who has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And like I said earlier, isn't that interesting? God doesn't care that you got Jesus in the temple. If he can run roughshod and torment you and, and mess with you constantly, you're of absolute no threat. They didn't care that they had a temple in Nehemiah's day. What they cared about and where they got angry is when they decided to build a wall. God says, by the Spirit of the Lord, I am building a wall in Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, and Team Embassy. These three ministries of ours are basically coming together and reaching out in different ways and means, but God is building a supernatural wall, and there are people joining, saying, me and my household, 
we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to take care of our gate, and we're going to become part of something bigger than ourselves. What was interesting is when the wall was starting to be built, they got afraid, and they attacked in every way possible to sidetrack Nehemiah. But when the wall was built, they were humbled. You know, it's time to humble the enemy, huh? don't you think? I liked it in Gideon's army. When those 300 struck, it says when they struck the enemy, they struck the enemy as one man. 300, not one, but they struck as one man. And when they struck the enemy, it said the enemy was in confusion. I like the enemy to be humbled and confused. I think we're seeing a lot of spiritual results in the kingdom of God even now that's confusing the enemy because they thought, he thought he had a plan that would work. God is smarter than the devil. Don't you believe that? Yeah. So there's no weapon formed against you that should prosper. He's well aware of strategies. But there is something that is imminently important for you, and that is that the wall around you is peace. Because then you, have, you pursue peace with one another. You pursue peace with God, with one another. There's the peace with God. There's the peace of God. And there's the God of peace who crushes the enemy. Peace is militant. Now, that's the promise he's given. Those who have no rule are like a city broken down. They don't care that you're born again. You're, you're pretty much unprotected. We talked about people who put up a wall whenever they're in a difficult situation at work, in the home, whatever. They tighten up in the gut. That's not Jesus. That's you. That's carnal. That's flesh. You know what? The enemy can walk right through that. Those walls are like burnt. He has access. He can come in and torment you left and right. But he can't torment and penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. He cannot penetrate that. Now, the second promise. That was Psalm 91, 14 to 16. Psalm 92, 10 and 15. This is where the Lord confirmed even the prophetic word that we got when we were at SIDS by Glenda Jackson. God said, your authority or your horn will be exalted like a wild ox. That has to do with spiritual authority. There's going to be an increase in your authority individually. This isn't for just Dennis. This was for the congregation. Her prophetic word applied to everybody, to whosoever complies or whosoever wants to or whosoever is connected enough to keep their heart clean toward one another. Try fasting a meal for someone that's really did you in. It will be the healthiest thing that ever happened to your insides because you will see that you are not a victim, that they're the ones in need. And grow up past that poor me, someone's picking on me. That's kindergarten still. Bless them that curse. Pray for them that despite you. Fast a meal for someone who's picked on you. Pray through your enemies during prayer time. Bless them. Release loving intercession to flow out to those that have come against you. I'll tell you what, your wall will be peace. And your strength will be the strength of a multitude. A threefold cord is not easily broken. And then you're going to walk in that anointing. Spiritual authority. My horn will be exalted. I've been anointed with fresh oil. Fresh oil means there is a new anointing. There's old anointings. Those that have been trained in the Holy Scriptures pull forth from the storehouse, out of the treasure of the storehouses, things that are fresh as well as familiar, new as well as old. But there's a fresh anointing coming upon the church, and we're going to see it. And it says, this fresh oil, your eyes will see my desire upon your enemies, and your ears shall hear the desire upon the wicked who rise up against me. We're going to hear testimony after testimony of victories. And your eyes are going to see it and your ears are going to hear it. So there's going to be spiritual authority, a new level, fresh oil. And the righteous will flourish like the palm tree. They will grow like the cedar. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of God. Now it's interesting, planted in the house of the Lord. It does imply you need to be connected. <laughs> you cannot 
flourish in the courts of just you. It says in the courts of our God is a corporate expression. All right? So they will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Flourishing. Fruit. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And this is where God's basically saying jurisdiction. I wish you'd memorize this. Uh, if you don't like, if you can't remember the word adjudication, use authority. It's still A. Jurisdiction. You have a jur I don't care where it is. I don't care if you're living at home with mom and dad. You're still there if that's where God placed you. You have authority there to respond in a particular way. That job that you don't like, you have a responsibility to be the best person on that stinky old job <laughs> because promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It's God that lifts up one and puts on another. Make sure your wall is the peace of God and God will bless everything you put your hand to. So jurisdiction, adjudicate or recognize your new authority. And this authority is coming from a corporate anointing that you're entering into. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. That'd be foolish to want to be alone. <laughs> Displacement. Displacement means that if I keep the rule of God in me in a hostile environment, I occupy. It's like the authority now is kratos. Kratos means dominion authority. I, in other words, uh, what was it? They used to use the example of the different kinds of authority. Um, exousia means I have a badge, like a policeman. Um, dunamis means I have the power to kick in the door. But kratos means I sit down and I occupy in a living room, and this is now my territory. I rule here. I've displaced the powers that be. The enemy has been displaced. That's true spiritual authority, kratos. Now, after that happens, there's only one step left, and this is the prophetic word for Kingdom Life Church. The only thing that's left is to advance. You've occupied. You've maintained your jurisdiction. You've walked in a new anointing. You're to expand the kingdom of God. And advancement is to advance the rule of the conquering king. To advance the rule of the conquering king. So what you, when you enter into the plans and the purposes that God has, you are advancing the rule of the conquering king. And we're going to see this in all various jurisdictions. And we're going to continue to hear testimonies because God says you're about to advance corporately as a church. And one of the telltale signs is if you get attacked, pay a close attention to the area that you're being attacked in because God says in Hosea 2.14, your valley of Achor, your valley of trouble, is actually going to be the door of hope. The very place you're being attacked is going to be the place of your greatest anointing. I like that idea. Therefore, we put a more implicit trust in God, not in ourselves. If you put your trust in yourself, you go, oh no, this area is a weak area in my life. This always happens. Well, how about if that weak area suddenly, because when you're weak, you're strong. Submit it to God and His Lordship. And when you're weak, be strong. I think it's funny that Jennifer and I even got really bad sinus colds and attacked when health is one of our strengths. You know, it's been years since we've been sick. Literally, right? It's just, it, we've been in better health since we've been 40. For decades now, We've walked in good health. It's really unusual for us to get a cold. And we got hit. And you know what I said? Something good's coming. Right? Because your, your, your trouble is the door of hope. So I'm going to start believing for healings in this congregation. Radical healings. Wonderful healings. Progressive, instant. I'll take any way we can get it. But we're going to walk in greater health and greater healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So don't be surprised by the attacks because that's, that's typical. Nehemiah, when he was going through it, didn't, it didn't scare the enemy till a wall was being built. 
That's when they got angry. They don't like a wall. They don't like unity. Oh, they, they would rather you were in strife. Don't you? If you could just get in strife with somebody, you'd be so much more pleasing to the enemy. Strife is just unforgiveness being worked out in everyday life. <laughs> I'd rather bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully you, do good to that hate you. Fast a meal for someone that's been on your case. Fast a meal for someone who's been on your case and you don't even know about it, they've been talking about you. Call that prevenient prayer. Pray ahead of the devil. Like there's somebody probably cursing me, someone, oh, I made them mad somehow. All of us have those people somewhere, you know, because they usually don't tell you why. They just do it. And then they'll talk behind your back. And they'll be like, oh, let's release loving intercession to them right now. Anybody. Oh, no. okay. For some of your friends on Facebook that give you a thumbs down or something, release blessings to them right now. All the thumbs down people. Oh, Jesus, bless them. Bless them, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. All right. At your valley of trouble, it's going to be a door hope. Now, I want to cover something because I want you to be prepared. This is more of a safeguard here, having to do with temptation and attacks. Uh, there's some foundational truths concerning temptation. And so you don't get religious, I mean. You don't go into condemnation. You need to have a thorough understanding that temptation is not sin. Say that back to me. Temptation is not sin. Okay? It's... <clears throat> and God tests, but he doesn't tempt, okay? What does it say? Whereas God never tempts us, James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anybody. But he'll allow you and watch how you respond to the tests in life. Hmm? At times... It's just important that we have a foundation in our life, family and ministry. Actually, you know what he's called pastors to do? Not to be the head honcho that's up on a, uh, on a pedestal. The pastor is basically his job is to get underneath the people and lay a foundation. Because people can go astray to the left and the right very, very easily. A shepherd is supposed to guard the sheep. But the best way to guard the sheep is not chase after people. Remember Jason gave that illustration of the rich young ruler. When Jesus told him, go sell all that you have, and he left, he didn't chase them. I don't know where you get that. He leaves the 90 to get, to get the one. He carried that too far. You've got people that actually want to be chased to control you. And every time they want to control you or they want attention, they will expect you to chase them. Jesus said, let them go. Now, if we're going to build a foundation under people, it will keep them from being swayed to and fro. Temptation begins in the flesh. Each one is pulled away when he's tempted by his own flesh. But the temptation is not sin. Did you know Jesus was tempted in every way? Yet without sin. So you can be tempted without sinning. Temptation in and of itself is not sin. Um, the oldest expression, this dates me because I think this probably goes back to who knows who. But a bird can fly over your head, but you don't have to let it make a nest. And if some old timer gave that, and that's what my teachers taught me. It's not a sin to have a bird fly over your head. If you let it make a nest in your hair, that's your responsibility. You let that happen. You, you, you played around there. It only becomes sin when we accept it, fondle it, enjoy it. <laughs> now here's the thing that you need to know about temptation though. the essence and the strength of the temptation is it wants you and I wish you would learn this because we teach it over and over again Jeremiah 2 13 my people have committed two sins they've forsaken me the fountain and they've hewn for themselves cisterns or substitutes now a temptation wants you to satisfy if you're a note taker you ought to write this down temptation wants you to satisfy a legitimate need 
illegitimately. The temptation wants you to satisfy. See, we've all got needs. We have needs for security. We have needs for peace. We were made that way. We have a need for affection. We have a need for attention. We have a need. But you, temptation wants you to satisfy that need in an, in a, in an illegitimate fashion. And when you do, just the law of sowing and reaping kicks in, and it gets stronger the more you satisfy that need illegitimately, it builds strength. Do you see when these early Jewish believers were teaching the Gentiles, they, they emphasized fences so much. Before it gets out of hand, deal with it. Deal with talking bad about somebody. If you deal with that, we don't have to worry you're going to murder somebody because you placed a spiritual fence. You nipped it while it was little because it does build strength. Somebody that murders somebody or commits adultery, that didn't fall out of the sky. That didn't just suddenly happen upon them. There was Lust that was never dealt with over a long period of time and it built power. Anger over a long period of time. You may say, well, murder's kind of extreme. Yeah, but you know, you, you, uh, you hate your brother. And like we shared the one way, you're not even allowed to not like your brother. When you don't like somebody, you basically, it's a mild form of hatred. And until you humble yourself and admit that, you will make excuses for yourself. My favorite uh, part of uh, Jason's teaching was the three types of people. There's the wise, the foolish, and the evil. And the wise will humble themselves and accept truth and change. Foolish, foolish are the ones who want the truth to change to adapt to their convenience. What? And they will go to great extents to do that. Rather than facing the truth and conforming and allowing it to change, you instead want to change the truth to make it more palatable. That's foolish. And of course, evil, actually foolishness carried far enough you become evil. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That fool is not someone who's not smart. It's a self-confident rebel that thinks they know better. Intelligence minus good judgment is foolishness. So you can be a genius IQ with poor choices and poor judgment and be considered biblically a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there's some intelligent people that say there's no God but they are biblically a fool, and it's not substandard intellect. All right? The problem of giving in to that temptation is something that I believe we're praying corporately to break, and it's called hardening of the heart. Hardening of the heart is through deception, and sin has a deceptive element to it, and it causes gradual hardening to where you don't get convicted. I really sympathize with those early Jewish believers who found Jesus as their Messiah and had to teach Gentiles who didn't even know right from wrong. They had to be taught what was wrong. You can't repent of something if you don't even know it's wrong. Well, my family's done this forever. All my friends do this. How could it be wrong? Everybody I know does this. That can't be wrong. Wrong. <laughs> lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, verses 11, I mean, verses 12 and 13. Now, <clears throat> Satan especially likes to tempt us when our faith is young. He also, I know he's done this on me over the years because from the time I was a baby Christian, they threw me on TV and radio, uh, full gospel businessman, before, when I was still wet behind the ears, they threw you in the public. And you know what? 
The enemy had his field day because one minute, he likes to attack you on, when you're on a high. And he loves to attack you when you're on a low. And so you, at some point, you better mature beyond the highs and the lows. <laughs> right? Because he has a field day when you're on a high. If, you're, if you don't know how to guard your heart. Wow. I mean, the first time, just a baby Christian praying for people and watching, I saw whole rows go down in the spirit and people, well, I went to bed that night, I didn't sleep because I pictured them standing up, falling down, standing up, falling down, wow, that was so cool, standing up, falling down. Then I got beat up real good after that, all right? You got to learn how to, you got to learn how to die to the successes and the failures, and keep an even keel, and it be expanding the kingdom of God and focusing in on him. It's about him. It's not about you. And so uh, that physical affliction, spiritual affliction, sometimes you're in an alien environment, too, and you're susceptible to that. And you're just not prepared for it. But always immediately following great spiritual highs and lows. Remember Elijah? He just had fire called down on Mount Carmel. Tremendous victory. The next thing you know, he's running from Jezebel because she said she's going to kill him. <laughs> he was vulnerable during the high. Matter of fact, he was mocking them, wasn't he? He was telling them, oh, maybe your God is in the bathroom. I don't know where he's at, but your God isn't doing nothing. Put water on the logs. Call fire down. But then Jezebel said, by this time I'm going to kill you. I'm no better than my father. Do you ever do that? One minute you're on the spiritual line, the next minute, I'm no better than my mother or my father's. So I'm my father's. So I went, I was, oh, no, 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 no. He never did that, though, I know. But I sure did. And what God's basically saying is, here's a little key right now for the days ahead. I'm going to give you a, a, a tool for your tool belt. And that is anything, anything that goes through your head that's not the new creation reality, you need to say, that's not me. That's not really that hard. It's a question of you don't have to accept everything that goes through your head. If it's not something God would say, say, that's not me. Do that for a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you what, you, you'll be walking... And you'll be wondering why all your friends are in spiritual warfare and you're not. Am I less than the rest of them? No, but most of them are getting beat up by their own carnality. And spiritual, the demonic doesn't even have to bother some people because their flesh beats them up enough. And that's an open door to the enemy. But if you say that's not me, any thought that's not scriptural, any thought that comes against you as a new creation reality, you don't need to own it. You can hear it without owning it. Now, here's some of the things. Fences. So that you're not treated like the proverbial frog in water. You know the old story? If you stay there gradually, the enemy can just turn up the heat until you die. All right? Here's, some, here's a list of some things that you can watch for as a caution. And I see the younger generation are falling for one in particular. Um, but anyway, uh, on the one hand, something that starts out as not blatant sin, but even as a good thing, if you carry it into license, then you're into sin. But it starts out good. So let's be prepared. Let's be, be aware of the enemy's devices on how temptation works. Because he will take something good and use it against you if he needs to. For instance, physical rest. Isn't it scriptural to take care of your body and to get physical rest? Physical rest can all of a sudden, and I've heard this, Oh, I don't, I, don't go any church. I don't go to church on Sunday anymore because I need my own Sabbath rest. Um, I worked hard all week, and so I need to relax. And, and they spiritualize that. I mean, I'm appalled, but there's a lot of people bought into that. When physical rest becomes laziness, 
You, went, you took something that was legitimate and put it into sin. I was too tired to go to church on Sunday because I was out late the night before. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed to tell anybody that. <laughs> they don't. Jesus said to the Messianic believers, to the Gentiles, he says, he who does not gather with me scatters. Here's the second one, quietness. Isn't it good to be quiet, to be slow to speak, right, quick to hear? But quietness can become a lack of communication. It's not a virtue anymore. And some people even pride themselves that they're quiet like they're somehow more holy than other people. Yeah, but God knows what's going on in your heart and head that you're not saying. You know, don't pick on us talkers all the time. You know, they, oh, my God. They're doing that in their head. So from the, in the sight of God, they need work too. It's not just a quiet. Quiet can be a good thing. A meek and a quiet spirit would be nice. And not talking all the time, but if it becomes non-communication, you've entered into sin. Isn't that subtle, the way the enemy works? See, he wants to take something and get you to push the envelope. And that's why they were so wise when those early Jewish believers were teaching Gentiles who were totally clueless. They taught them fences. You've got to nip it when it's little because you are prone to see how far you can push the envelope and, and call everything legalism. This is called license. This is called sin. You know, it's not legalism that's, li that's sin alone. It's license is sin alone. How many know that? All right, then you ought to be the ones that are crying freedom, freedom, freedom from legalism ought to have a good definition of what license looks like. If not, then you're just on the other side of the pendulum in sin. You went from the sin of legalism to the sin of license. Oh, wow, that's really impressive to God. All right, the ability to make a profit. That's a good thing, and I believe God encourage it. God was not a socialist. As far as I'm concerned, he believed in free trade and free enterprise. And he wanted them to see, I've given you so many talents, do something with it. Don't sit there and say, well, I was afraid to try. Mm. But that ability to profit, I've watched it with young people, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. I've watched it turn to greed. See, it's not money is not the problem, it's the love of money. And the desire to profit, changing to greed, is the way the enemy will push you and tempt you. Do you realize how much more business I could do on Sunday rather than go to church? You know how many more contacts I could make? He that does not gather with me scatters. Now, I realize there's people that have to work on Sunday. We don't live in a kind of culture where you can't do that. But I'm talking about the times when it's available and you find an excuse. <coughs> That's what we're looking for. God can't heal excuses. How about, this is the one that worries me the most right now. Enjoyment of life. Enjoyment of life. One of the main things that we taught in our teaching was that in simple prayer, everything I ever learned in the Spirit of God was to enjoy Him. And that enjoyment far exceeds any fun that you can have. But there is a trend now that fun, if you take my fun out of my life, uh, then you're just being religious or legalistic. And what that tells me is you've made a trade of fun or self-indulgence, let's call it what it is. You've taken something good because we should all be able to have fun. But in that enjoyment of life becomes self-indulgence, you just moved, pushed it over into sin. See, the enemy's not going to play fair, so I'm believing for a mature church that's going to know not just what legalism is, but what license is. 
because the pressure of the world is coming against church people and young people in particular. It's brainwashing them in their schools and it's basically telling them that you're to be tolerant. You know what they're telling you to be tolerant of? Be tolerant of everybody's immorality. That's not a virtue. They have no standard. And you're to be tolerant of us people with no standards. Our only standard is that you're tolerant of our lack of standards. Or else you're full of hate. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Physical pleasure becomes sensuality. You can do that. And the list goes on and on and on. But what I want to cover today is that we're going to begin pray, not just for people who are worried about legalism. What is legalism anyway? Simple definition. Trying. If you're trying in religion and you're getting tired, you're in legalism. Trust is surrendering and yielding. It is no longer I that live, but Jesus, the Messiah, who lives in me. When I yield to him, it is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. And even, uh, you know, we've taught people healing prayer for the longest time. And people see that as, oh, that sounds like so much work. Go through that 60-day challenge. I just keep looking at what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me. You're missing the whole point because what's preceded by healing prayer is enjoying him. I want his thoughts, his will, his emotions. I don't know about you, but I didn't learn healing prayer as works. I learned healing prayer as a result of a want to after enjoying Him. I spend communion time, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. That is the more significant part of my Christian walk, is I enjoy Him. I probably have more enjoyment and less spiritual warfare than a whole lot of you in the, in the church and are listening to this message. But I don't mind being searched by God, but I don't see that as drudgery or, oh, I got to deal with something. I got to deal with it. I got to deal with that. Man, it's a want to if you're enjoying Him. If you're not enjoying Him, then you're going to get religious and you're going to be trying to fix yourself and get all into self evaluation, self, 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 self. If it starts with self, it's not any good. <laughs> That's why God searched compared to self searched. And I'm going to close with that. One concept that stands out, and Jason mentioned it in one of his messages about the psychology today had an article. They finally realized, now, we've been pretty much brainwashed that it's the thoughts, the thoughts, the thoughts, the thoughts, the thoughts that got to change, the thoughts that got to change. And if you go through secular, what do they do to help you with your thoughts, your thoughts, your thoughts? They give you medication. What does medication actually do? Does it change the thoughts? Uh -uh. It subdues the emotion behind the thoughts. It keeps those emotions from being so volatile that it doesn't have the power behind the thought. I could see, I've prayed with people that were so heavily medicated that it was like, you didn't have to worry about the thought of suicide because uh, it's like, I'm too tired. <laughs> I don't I don't wouldn't have the energy to do it. And I'm not making fun of it, but I'm just showing you the seriousness of the emotions. If you don't deal with the power behind the thought, you're never going to deal with the thought. You can't take a thought captive unless you deal with the power behind the thought. And now, in psychology today, the article said they have discovered that for people who have suffered traumas, that they should feel the trauma. Okay. As opposed to what? As opposed to stuff it. They finally say, if you stuff it, you're a time bomb because what gets suppressed will get, pop out eventually. And it'll build even. You hold something underwater long enough, a rubber ball underwater, and it's going to pop up. All right? So you should feel it. What have we said for years? One of the easiest ways for a Christian, 
to let God take your pain and your sorrow is to momentarily, say that word with me, momentarily face the feeling. Feel the feeling momentarily to present it to God and let him take it away. Hmm? But if you're going to go, okay, God, take away all my bad feelings, take away all my traumas, okay, God, okay, okay, but I'm not going to experience any of them and I'm not going to face any of them. Might do it sovereignly, but I wouldn't put my hope in that because God usually only deals with what you present to him. If you won't allow yourself to feel, you want to be a head person and proud of it, you're going to be a basket case because it's the power behind the thoughts. I remember my dad saying, when I got saved, my dad goes, oh, Dennis needed that. I don't need it. I'm a basically good person. But Dennis, whoa, if anybody needed that Jesus, he did. And then when, before, then when my dad got converted, he said, I have to admit, because he was like the perfect nice guy. Everybody liked him. He had no enemies. If he did, he didn't know it the perfect nice guy, he said, I don't care how nice you think you are, you have thoughts that you know are not right. So be honest. There's nobody righteous, no, not one. <laughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. But God wants to restore that glory. And I believe that there's going to be a corporate anointing coming to this church, and I'm excited. So I know you won't get into legalism because that's trying. To try is T-R-Y, temporarily resist yielding. But now I'm concerned that you might get snookered into something that's legitimate and carry it too far. Hmm? How about us even? We're basically have an emphasis on emotional healing. But if you carry that too far, you're going to rescue people. That's what I liked about Jason's message. Jesus didn't rescue the rich young ruler and say, get back here, you need ministry, you can hear me. Hmm? How about the three disciples that came running to Jesus? I will follow you. He goes, foxes have holes, birds of the air, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It's kind of a deterrent to someone that said, I'm going to follow you. Then the other one says, I too will follow you, but let me go first bury my father. Oh, you, you come now. Gee, he seemed to know what button to push on everybody's life, didn't he? He knows what button to push in your life, too. And it might not be the same as the person next to you. Generosity becomes wastefulness. Judgment becomes criticism. Freedom becomes an occasion for the flesh. Improper intimacy in relationship breeds false spiritual unions. Pursuing goals can become a driving spirit. Do you know one of the key indications of a religious spirit is the person is driven. If you're, if you're worn out serving God, it's a good question that God, you are not following God, you are being driven by a religious spirit. Shouldn't be worn out, you should be enjoying the journey. But we're going to pray them and receive the promises, are we not? God's going to, be, we're going to be that wall. We're going to walk a new spiritual authority, fresh oil, flourish, and bear fruit. We're going to move to another level of anointing. And God says, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him with my salvation. All of those promises are for those that are knit together with him. That's all of us. I want that. You want that. You need that. So we want the I wills of the Father. So Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we're just going to start praying right now. There's physical healings that are going to take place at rapid, uh, rapid recoveries and instant healings in this congregation. There's going to be financial breakthroughs in various areas of their life on their jobs. There's going to be promotions. 
there's going to be even situations relationally that look pretty hopeless that God's going to restore. He's going to miraculously work for whosoever. We're going to start seeing impossible situations as the most likely ones for God to get His glory. God's going to basically reveal His glory. You know, He likes obscurity and He likes the impossible to make, make Himself known. We start seeing extended families, answers in extended families. God's going to start ministering to people and their families, and some of the least likely candidates are going to become the most in tune to God and the most open to the Spirit of God. So, Father, we thank you for, although there's no such thing as hopeless cases, <clears throat> the valley of trouble has been a door of hope. And right now, I want you to believe for the greatest anointing is going to be in the area of your most prevalent attacks. How many know what their most prevalent attacks are? What is the same old, same old? Then that's going to be your strongest anointing as more than conquerors in the days ahead. And releasing demands and expectations on anybody or anything other than God. Let's do that together because we have a tendency to control. We want a certain outcome. Hope in an outcome is not hope in God. We want a hope in God. So I'm releasing the demands and expectations to let God have His way in all the areas of my life. Let Him be Lord. Let Him be the great I Am. I Am that I Am. All that you need, I Am for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.